Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Virology Live. This is session number six. Today, we're going to talk about the synthesis of RNA from RNA. And before we dive into that, a little bit of RNA history to put today's story into perspective. 1935, well, by 1935, we know about nucleic acids. DNA had been discovered um, well before that year, uh, RNA before it as well. And in 1935, a, uh, a chemist by the name of Stanley crystallizes tobacco mosaic virus. He forms crystals of the virus. Now, he never... Uh, solves the structure because the computational power needed to do that wasn't available until the 1970s. But he crystallizes it. And remember, tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus discovered. He finds that it contains 5% RNA. And he thinks that's a contaminant. He thinks the protein is actually the genetic material. Stanley went on to get a Nobel Prize for this, one of, one of the more contentious Nobel Prizes. He really didn't know what he was dealing with. Of course, the RNA is the genetic material. Uh, he thought it was the protein. And really, to crystallize it, I, I just don't think that Nobel Prize material uh, we, I, I have had a couple of twivs with uh, Erling Norby, who used to be on the Nobel Committee and has a lot of insight. We talk about this in one of those. Uh, 1945, DNA is shown to be genetic material, as we have talked about. Uh, Avery McLeod McCarty experiment showing that DNA taken out of a bacterium, put in another bacterium, will transfer a property, a phenotype. 1952, the Hershey Chase experiment showing that DNA is genetic material for bacteriophage T2. 1953, the structure of DNA is solved. Very important year. Structure of DNA is solved. Vincent Racaniello was born. <laughs> That's not important for that. But I like to say somehow that, that uh, structure of DNA solved in 53 somehow uh, made me become a scientist in the end. 1956, the Frankel-Conrat experiment showing that RNA in tobacco mosaic virus is genetic material. So many years after Stanley contends that it's a contaminant, no, it's the genetic material. By 1959, many viruses were identified that contain RNA, and in the 1960s, Studies on viral RNA replication begin, which is the topic of today. Um, have, oh, someone else here has had a birth year in 1953. Lovely year, yes. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kate. And, um, well, it's not your birthday. Mine, mine was January 2nd. I don't know about yours. Um, and today we'll talk about uh, RNA and RNA reproduction. Uh, but people wanted to know what was copying this RNA because cells didn't seem able to copy RNA. So what was doing it? So today we are going to talk about, um, well, let's, you know, here's our Baltimore scheme, right? We're with our mRNA at the middle. We're going to talk about uh, viruses with RNA genomes and how they reproduce their RNA. We're going to talk about real viruses with double-stranded RNA, influenza, and VSV with negative-strand RNA, and poliovirus with plus RNA. We will not talk about retroviruses, which have plus RNA. They get their own lecture. Uh, they will, we will discuss them uh, in a few sessions. So the first experiment to identify an enzyme in virus-infected cells that could copy viral RNA is shown here. This was actually done by David Baltimore. He was a graduate student at the Rockefeller University, and uh, he said, well, the cell is not copying it, or we don't think so. Let's do an experiment. What he did, he infected cells with poliovirus, 
So there's poliovirus. This is a cell. It's not a fried egg. It's a cell. And um, uh, then at different times after infection, he would break the cells open to produce what we call a cell extract. You know, just remove the nuclei and any big stuff, and you have a nice extract of the cytoplasm, basically. He would add the four precursors of RNA, ATP, UTP, GTP, and CTP. And one of these uh, was radioactively labeled. Um, and then uh, he would incubate and measure RNA synthesis by the incorporation of that radioactivity into RNA. So here we have the graph of the results. Here on the x-axis, this is hours post-infection. This is a rapid infection. Poliovirus infection of cells goes very quickly. Six hours, it's almost up, at least the first cycle, from zero to six hours. And then on the left, there are two y-axes here. On the left, we have RNA polymerase activity in the open circles. And on the right, the good scientist that David was, he did a plaque assay of every time point, and we measure virus PFU per ml. And so obviously for um, this experiment, what you could do is you could take your uh, cell extract and take a little bit of it and do a plaque assay, and then uh, to the rest, uh, do your RNA synthesis measurement. So here what we see is, let's look at PFU first. There's an eclipse period, right? Then at between two and three hours, you see the production of infectious viruses, which peaks at about six hours, a nice one-step growth curve. And look at the RNA synthesis. It also goes up between two and three hours, peaks a little bit before the peak of viral infectious viral RNA, uh, and then declines. So the first evidence for uh, RNA polymerase in infected cells, and you can see it is not there's no RNA polymerase activity at zero, at one, at two hours post-infection. So the cell cannot make RNA from uh, viral RNA. And there's already viral RNA in these cells. We've infected them. And so this is a viral RNA polymerase. Uh, subsequently, Baltimore was thinking about this problem of RNA viruses and RNA polymerases. And so he came up with this idea that in minus strand RNA virus particles, there would have to be an RNA polymerase because the minus RNA cannot be translated to protein. So he, th he, he theorized that there would be polymerase in the particle, and he did the experiment, and he showed it after the poliovirus experiment. Subsequently, when we became, became able to sequence uh, genomes of RNA viruses in the 70s and 80s beginning, uh, we could look at the sequence and find a motif which is common for an RNA polymerase. It's, it's gliasp-asp. We'll show you what that means in a moment. You could then take the gene, the DNA, for the polymerase. You could synthesize the protein in a cell and then show that it has polymerase activity. And finally, uh, the crystal structures of these proteins uh, were determined, and that tells us, of course, how these proteins function, and we'll talk about that today. And so this enzyme is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. RDRP has, is how I will abbreviate it. And in, again, in minus strand RNA genomes, the particle contains the RDRP. The RNA is, in addition, coated with a protein, typically some kind of a nucleocapsid protein, and it, that forms the nucleocapsid. Remember, it is a substructure in these envelope viruses. On the left, vesicular stomatitis virus, a virus related to rabies, and on the right, influenza virus. In both cases, the negative strand RNA is present as a nucleocapsid, and there's an RNA polymerase in the particle. Plus strand RNA genomes, in contrast, there is no polymerase in the particle. Of course, it's encoded in the genome. Polymerase is an enzyme that synthesizes RNA. Someone's asking, what is a polymerase? It's an enzyme that synthesizes RNA. It polymerizes it, which means it adds bases one after another. That's where the word comes from. But for these plus-stranded RNA genomes, the RNA 
in the particle is naked. There is no polymerase, there is no protein. But there are two exceptions. The genome of retroviruses and coronaviruses, despite being plus stranded, they are coated with protein. And in addition, the retrovirus particle has reverse transcriptase in it. We'll talk about that another time. The coronavirus particle, there's no RNA polymerase in the particle because that's a plus-stranded RNA that is translated when it infects a cell. So here are these viruses, poliovirus, a flavivirus, both plus-stranded RNA. Coronavirus, unusual because the RNA is coated with protein. And of course, the plus-stranded uh, retrovirus genome contains reverse transcriptase. And finally, double-stranded RNA virus genomes. Remember, the double-stranded RNA cannot be translated. The plus strand is there, but it's blocked by the minus strand. So these viruses have to make mRNA, so they carry a polymerase into the particle, although the RNA in the particle is naked, no nucleoprotein. Let's talk a little bit about nucleocapsids. Here on the, on the top left is vesicular stomatitis virus. Remember, the RNA is coiled up in a helical fashion inside the particle. Uh, the RNA is shown there in green, and the RNA is bound by multiple subunits of the nucleocapsid protein. It is one protein, this little blue sphere repeated over and over and over, wound around the viral RNA. On the bottom is the actual structure of the nucleocapsid protein, or the N protein as it's called for VSV. Two lobes with a groove in between the lobes, and in that groove is the RNA binding part. That's in, the RNA is shown here in green. And so this protein is shown in a segment of the actual nucleocapsid in, in blue there. It's shaded a darker blue. And you can see there are many of these nucleocapsid proteins uh, attached to the RNA and wound around and around in a helix. That's the basis of uh, helical symmetry, which we talked about last week. On the right is influenza virus. It's genome negative stranded, eight pieces, and each piece is bound with proteins, including the NP nucleoprotein to form a helical structure, and the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, which in the case of influenza virus is made of three different proteins, as we will see in a bit. Here in the middle is the nucleoprotein of influenza virus. Again, two lobes with a groove in the middle into which the RNA fits. It's shown as a green ribbon here. And on the bottom is the space-filling model of the helix, similar to what we just saw for VSV. And here in E, we're looking at it end-on down. So this is a view uh, going looking down the, the tube, if you will. And on the right, we're looking at it from the side. So there is one monomer, one copy of the nucleoprotein there in dark blue. And again, it forms a helix uh, wrapped around the protein. Now remember that RNA structure, RNA has structure. It's not just a line. We, sh we always show DNA and RNA as lines, but it's not. And I've told you before that it can form structures, but let's just go over that again because it's important. Here in panel A, you can see that RNA can form stem loop structures. So here at the very end is a stem loop. All that is, these four bases here in the RNA can base pair, they can hybridize with four bases slightly downstream. If you stretched out this RNA, uh, these four bases to which the first four are base pairing are slightly downstream. And in between, there's a loop of unpaired bases. These can be various lengths, and they can be complicated, as you can see here, that you could form multi-branched loops. This one has two branches. You can have bulges in the middle of them as well. So this is important. Um, uh, for function. These, these stem loops bind proteins typically and have important roles in reproduction. The, the next one here is a specialized kind of stem loop structure, which we'll talk about a bit today. It's called a pseudonaut. Pseudonaut meaning it looks like a knot as you would take a, a piece of string and knot it, right? 
it looks like that, but it's actually not knotted. Boy, there's a tongue twister. So what is a pseudo knot? Here we have an RNA in green, and it's forming a stem loop. But a number of bases in the loop are actually base pairing with some bases downstream. So they're complementary. So if this base were an A, uh, the, the, the base that it's pairing with uh, down here would be a U, and a G, and a C, and so forth. Now, the consequence of that is that the RNA looks folds into what we call a pseudonaut. And so in, in the next panel is another version of that, a little more accurate. You can see the, the, uh, the, st the loop is bent down. And then in the bottom is actually the, the way the RNA flows. So these two base paired regions are what we call coaxial. They're just lined up with each other. All right, coaxial cable is just one long run of a single cable. That's what this means, coaxial. And then finally, the actual structure of the RNA is shown in panel C, where the backbone is the green ribbon, and then the, 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 uh, the, the bases are shown as red uh, structures. And you can see there's, there's base pairing in various parts of in the two parts of this stem loop. There's one part which is in uh, cyan and, and one part is in red here. So this looks like a knot, but it's not really, right? Because the RNA doesn't actually go through uh, in, in one of these loops. And I showed you before this piece of RNA from HIV-1, and it has many, many stem loops, as you can see, and they fold in the three-dimensional structure shown at the bottom here, determined by cryo-electron microscopy, or actually maybe it was mass spec, I don't recall, um, but three-dimensional structures, so which you can't depict in these drawings on paper. Now, there are many, there are a number of rules for RNA synthesis that are very important to remember. Uh, here's an RNA, and it's, I'm showing it to you from the five prime to the three prime end, and it's in Kelly green, which means it's plus stranded by our convention, by our color convention. First of all, the RNA genome must be copied end to end with no loss of sequence. It intuitively makes sense, right? If you're going to copy this, you have to copy everything because if you lose something, then it probably the genome won't work. And second, so that's the genome member. Then there's there are viral mRNAs, which we have already mentioned may or may not be the same as the genome, and we'll explore that more today. mRNAs have to be produced that can be translated. So you, got, you have two kinds of RNA synthesis going on. You're having genome RNA synthesis, and you're having mRNA synthesis. And sometimes it's the same, and sometimes it's not. And this will become very clear today. Diving in more deeply, the RNA synthesis itself, so RNA-directed RNA synthesis, that's what we call this. The RNA is a template for making more RNA. The universal rules are shown here. First of all, RNA synthesis begins and ends at specific sites on the template. So here in this diagram, here is a template in black, and we are showing it from the three prime end to the five prime end. And RNA synthesis begins at specific sites. It doesn't begin randomly, always beginning at specific sites. And the polymerase may initiate de novo, which means it does not require a primer, or sometimes it requires a primer. What does that mean? So here I'm showing you in red a primer. It is a short piece of RNA that is base pairing uh, with the template, and that is going to be used by the polymerase to start synthesis of the complementary strand. So some RDRPs require a primer. Others do not. Right? Do, and when they don't need a primer, we call that de novo synthesis. And our, our cells have a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That is the enzyme that makes our messenger RNAs. Those also do not require a primer. Okay, very important idea. And when the primer is hybridized, it, it, the chain, 
is going to be synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction by reading the template in a three to five prime direction. A little bit of confusion. Uh, besides the RNA polymerase, often other viral proteins and cell proteins are needed for RNA synthesis, as you'll see today. And here, what I've just told you, RNA is synthesized by template directed. That means the polymerase is looking at the template and saying, ah, here's a G, a C needs to go in there. Template directed stepwise incorporation of triphosphates and elongated in a five to three prime direction. So the synthesis is five to three prime, but the reading of the template is three to five prime. All right, that's a little bit confusing for many, but the template is read three to five prime, the synthesis is five to three prime. Uh, NTP is nucleoside triphosphate. These are the precursors of viral RNA. And finally, I've shown you a lot about there being a template here, and then what we make, what the polymerase makes is complementary to the template. There are some examples of non-templated synthesis where the polymerase is making a product and there's no template. You'll see uh, at least one example of that today. Um, but there are a number in the viral virosphere where it's usually part of a templated synthesis. So the enzyme is copying a template and then for for a variety of reasons, the enzyme detaches and inserts a number of bases that are not in the template and then goes back to the template. Okay, so remember there's also non-templated synthesis, but it's it is it is quite rare. So let's go through the process of RNA synthesis. This is uh, this is a little deep, folks. I understand it, uh, but um, you understand this, and you can understand a lot of aspects of viruses. You know, RNA synthesis is important. A lot of the antivirals are going to target this. Uh, evolution involves this, so it's good reasons to learn this. Two modes of initiation. We're going to start with initiation. I've already told you there's de novo and primer dependent, right? So de novo means you don't need a primer. And so what happens there, the polymerase is able to see the very three prime base on the template, the first base N1, and simply add the complement. And there's, for these uh, enzymes, there's actually a little platform in the enzyme that the RNA abuts and then the, uh, the first base is added. It's not just floating around. It's too hard to do that way. So the first base is added complementary to the first base on the three prime end and then the second and the third and so forth. And then we have primer dependent. Uh, some polymerases need primers. We're going to talk today about a primer that is actually a protein and to which a few bases are initially added, and that serves as a primer. And then today we're also going to talk about what are called capped primers. A cap is shown here in blue, which is a uh, very specialized structure at the 5' prime end of messenger RNAs, most messenger RNAs, and it's important for translation. Uh, the capped primer is needed for influenza virus synthesis, as we will see. So it is actually stolen from host cell messages, the cap plus a little bit of host cell mRNA. We'll get to that. So two kinds of initiation, de novo and primer dependent. Now the way the polymerase works, which we call catalysis. Catalysis seem, simply means the synthesis of RNA. It's a catalytic reaction. It's an enzymatic reaction occurs by what we call a two-metal mechanism. You could also call it heavy metal if you'd like, but it's not really a heavy metal. It's, a, it's magnesium, which is a metal. Uh, and this is actually a mechanism that's conserved for both DNA and RNA polymerases, so it's quite ancient. So remember, again, we have our template going in a three to five prime direction. In this case, we have a primer. The polymerase is then adding bases they will the polymerase will attach the first base to the primer, and then that will continue down on the template, and the chain will grow. Now, here on the right is what I mean by a two-metal mechanism. This is a 
double-stranded DNA here and a DNA polymerase to illustrate this. Uh, the reason is that uh, in the text, it was drawn for the polymerase chapter. And we, I just repurposed it for the RNA chapter. Uh, but basic, that really emphasizes that the mechanism for RNA and DNA catalysis is the same. So here we have uh, a duplex. We have a DNA polymerase, which is synthesizing the light blue complementary strand in a 5 to 3 prime direction. It's reading the template in a 3 to 5 prime direction. And here on the right is the chemical structure of the template and the product. So the template is has one, two, three, four bases, only four for illustrative purposes. And so here we have a G, and the G is uh, attached to a ribose. So every base comes with a ribose, a sugar, and then it has a, a base attached to it, which can be G, T or U, depending on it, whether it's DNA or RNA, A and C. Then we have a phosphodiester linkage, one phosphate linking that G to the next one. And here we have a T. If this were RNA, it would be U. There's our sugar, another phosphodiester bond, etc. Now the product strand is complementary. So if there is a G, the polymerase will put in a C. If there's a T or a U, the polymerase will put in an A. And these two lines, by the way, uh, between the T and the A and the G and the C, you can see there's three for the GC and there are two for the AT. That's because there are three hydrogen bonds possible between the C and the G and only two between the A and the T. So CG pairs are stronger than AT pairs. And what happens when the polymerase adds a base? So a nucleoside triphosphate is put into the enzyme. So here we have an A in the template. So the enzyme is going to insert a T. The T comes in initially as a triphosphate. And if it were RNA, which is what it is today, this would be a U. Sugar, ribose sugar, and then one, two, three phosphates. That's where NTP comes from, nucleoside triphosphate. So the nucleoside is the base plus the sugar and then triphosphate. Then we're going to lose two of these phosphates to form the bond with the previous base that's been added on. And that's where the two metals come in. Here's one metal, magnesium, and here's the second. These are held in place by amino acids in the active site of the polymerase. Uh, here we can see two aspartates, aspartic acid, amino acids. These are part of the active site. You'll see in a moment exactly where they are. They're holding in the magnesiums. And the magnesiums catalyze these series of reactions. Uh, they're, they're actually called nucleophilic attacks, if you remember your organic chemistry, but not necessary to remember. Basically, the magnesiums help uh, the oxygens attack the phosphate bonds. They eliminate two phosphates, and this single phosphate, the alpha phosphate, which is the one closest to the sugar, is left in to, to join the the two bases. So remember, there's always one phosphate between two bases, and that one remains the alpha phosphate. The other two are released as what is called pyrophosphate, PPI, two phosphates. A two metal mechanism of catalysis. The metals are essential for catalysis of nucleic acid. All right, let's take a quiz. Here and let's see. Uh, actually, I don't want to do that. Right? I want to keep it on the quiz, and we go to Socrative, and we go to our. No, I don't want to go to the streaming tab. Here we go. Okay. Question one: What is a universal rule about RNA-directed RNA synthesis? One or A, RDRP may initiate de novo or require a primer. B, RNA synthesis initiates randomly on the RNA template. RNA is synthesized in a 3 to 5 prime direction. RNA synthesis is always template directed. So what is a universal rule? And while we're looking at that, I will 
go to check out some questions here. As far as I know, all plant RNA viruses encode a suppressor of RNA silencing to interfere with chopping of double-stranded intermediates. True for human RNA viruses. It's controversial. Controversial. So in plants and insects, uh, siRNA, small RNAs, are, are clearly antiviral. Whether they are in uh, mammalian cells is controversial, and it's been controversial for a number of years. Some people think it is, some don't. So whether uh, viruses have, what, viruses certainly do have RNA binding proteins for other reasons in innate immunity, as we will see. But whether they apply to short interfering RNA is not clear. Is it possible to add anions to bond magnesium in cells to prevent the polymerase from using them? The problem is that cell processes need magnesium also, so that would be toxic. Right? That's why you like heavy metal, because it's important for catalysis. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that underlies it all, right? So Socrative.com, log in as a student with the room number virus if you want to take the quiz. Where are the NTPs created? Are there enzymes in the cell that make them? Some viruses encode part of the synthesis machinery for NTPs because our DNA and our RNA require them, right, as well. Does SARS-CoV-2 require a primer? No, it's a primer-independent polymerase. Is the metal involved always magnesium. So some, sometimes it can be manganese. In, in the lab, in, in the test tube, you could get these enzymes to use manganese. But it looks like in, in actual life, it's mostly magnesium. <laughs> what exactly is the template? The template is simply a name for what's being copied. And so... The viral RNA is in a virus. You get infected, the virus gets in your cell, its RNA gets put in the cell, and that serves as a template to make more genomes or mRNA. <laughs> I wish I played more, paid more attention in chemistry. Well, you can learn it now through virology, yeah. All right, let's see, we will Star that one, turn this off, and go to the quiz. Let's see what we got here. Um, most of you got A. RDRP may initiate de novo or require a primer. So that's certainly correct, right? RNA synthesis initiates randomly. No, I, I said it doesn't. It's synthesized in a 3 to 5 prime. No, 5 to 3 prime. The template is copied 3 to 5 prime or read three to five prime. Synthesis is five to three prime. RNA synthesis is always template directed. No, sometimes it's not template directed, right? Okay. So now that we have sequences of many RDRPs, we can compare them, RDRPs and other polymerases, not just RDRPs, and that's shown here. So these are protein sequences of four, of the four known classes of polymerase. We know of four polymerases, and their proteins are shown here lined up. They have a homology, as you will see. Here is today's polymerase, RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Then we have RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That's reverse transcriptase. We have DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, copies our DNA. And then we have DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which makes messenger RNAs 
and tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs in our cells. And they, they share amino acid uh, similarity. And the, the parts that are colored shows that. They're, for example, the A area is common in all of these polymerases, although it's not in the same place as you can see here. These polymerases are at different lengths. And there's a green one that's common. There's a yellow one. There's a purple one. And so two of them, the two on top, have the uh, cyan. Now, for, first of all, this yellow one is really important. It's basically where the action happens. It's the catalytic site of the enzyme. And you will find in this yellow region, this, this yellow stretch of amino acids, that uh, conserved three amino acid sequence, which I told you was GDD, Gly, Asp, Asp. Those are amino acids. And depending on the virus, they're slightly different. So for polio and Rio, it's Gly, Asp, Asp. For, for Berna's, which is another kind of double-stranded virus, it's Ala, Asp, Asin. You know, influenza is slightly different, VSV, HIV. The point is two of these are coordinators of the heavy metals, <laughs> the magnesium. So for example, the Asp, Asp in the polio polymerase coordinates the two metals. And we'll see a picture of that in a moment. Now, three-dimensional structures of all these polymerases have been solved. And so those are shown down at the bottom for representative uh, enzymes. So here is a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It's called the Klenau fragment. That's just a colloquial name for it. Then we have a T7 RNA polymerase, which is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And we have the reverse transcriptase. This is one from HIV. And then the RDRP is from poliovirus. All these, these polymerases have in common a structure that has been uh, likened to a right hand, right? There's your right hand with the active site. The active site means where the nucleic acid is polymerized. The active site is in the palm of the polymerase. And then that's where the GDD is. And I'm, let me show you the palm first of all. So in all these polymerases, you can see the yellow. That's this conserved sequence in the middle here. That's the active site. And the, the uh, say, gliasp, asp, those are part of the yellow sequence. And I'm going to show you this in more detail in a moment. The blue parts are the fingers of the polymerase or the right hand. The fingers form a cage which protects the active site. Sometimes the fingers touch, sometimes the thumb and the forefingers touch, like in the polio polymerase. Sometimes they don't, like HIV, RT, or the, the three others that don't really touch. You can see there's a gap uh, here. But for the polio one, the active site is actually completely encircled. So the active site is where the polymerization occurs. So let's take a look at this in more detail for the poliovirus polymerase. Okay, poliovirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase solved a number of years ago by X-ray crystallography. Again, looks like a right hand. There's the active site in yellow. It consists of two beta strands, and there are the two aspartate residues. Remember, the conserved trio is gliasp-asp, and those are the two aspartates. And those are going to hold the magnesiums that are important in the catalysis reaction. So Everything is happening in here. The other uh, parts of the polymerase are colored. Uh, the, the blue are the fingers and thumb. And then these other motifs, red, uh, magenta, uh, et cetera, green, those are the conserved sites that are shown here uh, in the enzyme. All right, so this is the overall architecture. And how does the polymerization work? Well. Here's the poliovirus RDRP now in, in what we call a space-filling view. In the previous one, this is a ribbon diagram. It's only the backbone. Remember, a protein is a chain of amino acids linked together. There's a backbone that's all linked, and then the side chains stick off. So here we're just showing the backbone, no side chains. Here, we've got all the side chains in, plus we are showing everything, at, at least the protein, as spheres. And so we have three different views here, top, front, and back. It's colored exactly the same as before. 
Uh, and we've removed some amino acids here so that you can look inside and see what's going on. Now on the top view, what you can see is where the RNA enters. So what would enter is a single-stranded plus RNA, which is in, uh, in dark green here. The RNA comes in. There's a channel at the top. It goes right past the active site. And remember, the active site is in yellow. And I have colored the two magnesiums in um, magenta there. Because you can see they're right in the active site. The RNA comes in the top. Then it makes a right-hand turn. It goes past the active site. It gets polymerized, so a second strand is added. And then there's an exit site on the right-hand side here. And out comes double-stranded RNA, uh, which will eventually be copied again to make uh, more plus strands. So in the top, out the side. And this will all be filled in here. I've removed them so that you can look inside here. Here's a front view. Again, template going in the top, product, double-stranded product going uh, out the front. Actually, the coloring I told you was wrong. The template is, is colored here in um, cyan. And it's not a good convention, but I didn't make these figures. I should redo them. And then the, the product, which is copied from the template, is shown in green. So you can see here the template cyan is going in. Makes a right-hand turn in the active site, comes out the front double-stranded. The back of the enzyme is interesting also. Here is the back. There's a little channel where the NTPs go in. Cool. So if you, if you look at this left-hand view, the NTP entry site would be back here. And so as the RNA is coming into the top, the NTPs have to get in too, right? They come in through a separate elevator. All right. Now, I want to show you a really close-up view of the active site to give you some, in some more insight about what's going on here. It's pretty cool. So here is our um, yellow part of the polymerase, right? The, uh, the two beta strands that form the active site. And here are the ASPs uh, on that. The two ASPs, 230, uh, 328 and 329, those are going to coordinate the magnesiums that assist in catalysis. The magnesiums are not shown. But here uh, is the is, is a base that is being held, actually a nucleoside triphosphate, UTP, uh, bound in the active site. So this has come in through the back of the polymerase, and it's going to be added presumably to an A in the template. So the template is not shown here. It would be running through here, and this would be lined up to base pair with the A. The way this works, by the way, is so the, the RNA is sitting here. Let's say there's an A in the active site. The, the polymerase tries all four triphosphates really quickly because how would the polymerase know which one to pull in through the channel? No way to know. So they all come in and out like really, really fast. And if a G goes in, nope, wrong. If a, uh, if a C goes in, nope, wrong. If a U goes in, no. Only an A works. And you may think how inefficient that is. This is happening at really, really fast speeds, okay? So here's a U in here. And um, the uh, these these make, so the, here's the structure. I've, I've actually flipped these around from what I put in the PDF because I think this, this looks better. So here is a, um, a U, a uracil. That's the base, bound to a ribose. And it has three phosphates attached to it. One, two, three. Okay, that's what's sitting here in this active site. And the various residues are forming interactions with different amino acids in the polymerase. That's how these are held in place. You can see uh, here as well with this red part of the, the active site. And then there's going to be magnesiums on the aspartate, which will participate in the joining of this to the, f the previous base. So that's how these bases fit in the active site. Now, these, these enzymes only use RNA bases. They don't use DNA bases. They can only make RNA from RNA templates. Why is that? Well, it's right here. We can explain it very easily. RNA, as you may know, on the sugar, the ribose, has two hydroxyl moieties, two OHs. DNA, and this is a DNA base, this would be TTP, thymidine triphosphate, only has one hydroxyl. 
That's why it's deoxyribonucleic acid, right? Because <laughs> it's missing an a uh, hydroxyl here. That hydroxyl, the two prime hydroxyl of RNA, base pairs with ASP. 238 on the red strand in the polymerase, and that's what needed for polymerization. If a, if a DNA triphosphate came in here, it wouldn't be able to base pair, not base pair, it wouldn't be able to form this interaction. It could be a hydrogen bond, and it would be kicked out. And so that is how the enzyme discriminates. Now, you can change this D238 and get the enzyme to accept DNA. So that's the key for recognizing RNA over DNA, right? Now let's talk. A, take some 10,000-foot view of how uh, RNA synthesis occurs. We really zoomed into the polymerase, uh, but let's step back. Let's first talk about plus strand RNA viruses, two different families we're going to talk about today. The Flavian Picorna viruses, these are plus strand RNA viruses, where the genome is a single strand of RNA, it's plus stranded, and it is it can be translated directly, of course. The uh, the Flavies have a cap at the five prime and the Bacornas don't, they have a protein. And this is copied to make a minus strand, full length complement, which is then copied to make more plus strands. Those can be translated into protein, or eventually they can be packaged into virus particles. So in these cases, for these viruses, and flavies include West Nile and dengue, yellow fever, etc. These, for these viruses, the mRNA and the genome are the same. This molecule is both translated and put into the particle. The minus strand is simply a reagent that's needed to make more plus strands. It has no other function in the cell except to serve as a template to make more plus strands. All right? That's important. Now, the other group of viruses we're going to talk about are the alpha viruses. These are also plus stranded RNA viruses. They include, they include viruses like Sindbis virus, some leaky forest virus, chikungunya virus, plus stranded RNAs. And by the way, these are polyadenylated RNAs, which that's what this little ANAOH3 prime is, you know, one or 200 A's at the end needed for translation. So they're capped, polyadenylated. But the twist here is that there is a subgenomic mRNA made, which has to be made from the minus strand. Subgenomic meaning it only covers part of the genome. Why it does that? Well, you can't ask why questions. What's the function of that? It works. There's no particular function. Obviously, you could translate all proteins from one RNA. Why, you know, there's no reason you need to do a subgenomic, but it exists. Okay, so let's take a dive into poliovirus as an example. Polio and Flavies uh, do things very similarly. Uh, and um, the uh, overall reproduction scheme of uh, poliovirus is shown here. So the virus is attaching to a cell receptor uh, at the top. Uh, here we go, my, my cursor back. The, the particles internalize. Remember last time we talked about how the receptor induces catalysis of um, or release of the RNA from the particle. So the RNA ends up in the cytosol, and this is plus RNA, so it can be immediately engaged by ribosomes. The proteins can be made for these viruses. The polymerase proteins are at the C-terminus of the protein, and those polymerase proteins are what carry out genome reproduction. For most RNA viruses, the genome reproduction occurs on membranous vesicles, with, with, uh, which are induced by viral proteins. These membrane vesicles don't exist in uninfected cells. So the, the plus RNA is copied to minus RNA, double, actually double-stranded RNA, and then the double-stranded RNA is used to make more uh, plus RNAs, which can either be translated or packaged into new virus particles. That's the overview. The genome is a single RNA. It's about 7,400 bases long. It is uh, linked at the five prime end to a protein. There's a small untranslated region. Uh, then we have the, the bulk of the RNA, which encodes one long protein. 
a stop codon and a three prime untranslated region, then a poly A sequence at the three prime end. This RNA is translated to make one long protein. It's called a polyprotein. That protein is then chopped up into the, the proteins that are needed to make new viruses, including the capsid proteins, VP1 through 4. Uh, the polymerase proteins are down here at the, three at the C terminus of the protein. There are two viral proteinases that carry out these cleavages. They're called 2A and 3C. So these are enzymes that chop up the viral RNA. How does genome synthesis occur? First, let's take a look at the very five prime end of the RNA. It's the first uh, 100 so bases. That is the very first base. It's a U. It is linked covalently to a small protein, a small viral protein called VPG. It's about 20 some amino acids in length. And the, f the function of that will become apparent in a moment. Then we have RU, and then the first 100 bases or so. And these actually form a clover leaf structure with a couple of stem loops here that you'll see are important for replication. The RNA has a number of structures that are important for genome replication. There's that clover leaf at the 5' end. There's actually a what's called a Cree element, a cis-acting RNA element, which is movable in, in different picornaviruses, polioviruses, rhinoviruses, others, can be anywhere within the genome. And then at the 3' end is a pseudonaut. And these give specificity to the polymerase because in a cell infected with these viruses, only viral RNA is copied. No cellular polyadenylated RNAs are copied by the viral RNA polymerase. So that's amazing specificity. And that specificity is conferred by these structures. These secondary structures are not present in cellular RNAs. They're needed to be for the viral RNA to be copied. And how the copying happens is really interesting. The uh, polymerase, first of all, the polymerase is called 3CD here. It binds to that Cree element. Let's go back. The Cree element that's movable can be anywhere in the genome. It's a stem loop. The point is that the polymerase binds to it. And then a single molecule of VPG, which is the protein stuck on the 5' prime end, right? Right there, VPG. It's a viral protein. VPG comes in. And then the polymerase adds two U's to the protein. This Cree element, this loop, is mostly A. So the polymerase uses that as a template to put a couple of U's on VPG. And you may be wondering, what is all this for? This is the primer for the RDRP, VPG UU. This is a primer-dependent enzyme, and it's cool because it's protein-linked. There aren't a lot of protein-linked primers, but there are some, and this is one of them. Oh, someone wants to know what is a cis-acting RNA element. That's a good question. Cis means it works in the genome where it's present. And so the polymerase is binding to it, and that is functioning on its genome as opposed to on another genome. A little bit of an obscure. It's a genetic term that is not important for us at this point. That's just the name that it has. But the point is the way it works is the polymerase will bind to it, as will a molecule of VPG, and then the polymerase simply adds two U's onto the VPG. And so what happens then is that this, this is the overall scheme of RNA synthesis for poliovirus. This is all membrane-bound, so there is a viral protein bound to the membrane of those little vesicles uh, to which the replication complex then attaches. Here's our RNA now, and we have our clover leaf at the 5' prime end, and there is our poly A at the 3' prime end with the pseudonaut. And what happens is in the cell there's a protein called poly A binding protein. And that binds poly A, and in poliovirus, it actually binds part of the clover leaf. So it makes the three prime end come around and be right next to the five prime end. Then a molecule polymerase will uh, attach to this actually five prime end complex, but the three prime end of the RNA is there. And it will take a molecule of VPGUU that it's just made on the 
cis-acting RNA element, the Cre, and use it as a primer to start copying the 3 prime N. And it will keep going and eventually make a full-length minus strand. So the neat part here is that the polymerase is brought to the 5 prime end, and then it starts initiating at the 3 prime end of the RNA because of the way the RNA is circularized here. And so uh, that's the function of the clover leaf and the, uh, the VPG primer. And you can see that the VPG UU base pairs perfectly with two A's uh, in that poly A tail. All right, it's time for another question. which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy. A, production of subgenomic mRNAs. B, de novo without primer, initiation of RNA synthesis. C, circularization of template for initiation of RNA synthesis. D, all of the above. What's part of the polio replication strategy? So let's go back to the questions. Lots of questions now popping up. I missed a few weeks. Can we email you if we have questions? Yes, of course. Vincent at microbe.tv. <laughs> I had chemistry a long time ago, but the difference is that I've been thinking about it for all that time, right? Thinking about viruses, you have to think about chemistry. Yep. Oh, you're going to take your immunology final. Good luck. <laughs> oh, I think this was answered, but those are the single, yeah, Vanity answered this. Those are the single amino acid codes for gliasp, asp. Comment on what conserved means. Conserved means that whatever we're talking about, in this case a GDD, gliasp, asp, these three amino acids are present in more than one virus at the same place in the same protein. We're going to use that term a lot in the rest of this course, right? So, um, you know, in humans, our eyes are conserved in the same position more or less, right? And then there's a nose between them among all humans. And so in the similar way, we talk about amino acids in the same place in a protein, or even nucleotides in the genome. And, and it's totally cool if the mods answer questions. That's what they're here for, yeah. I will try and get ones that they don't answer. <clears throat> How common are now, when the, when the mod ans asks a question, well, another mod could answer it too, but I will. How common are RDRP between viruses and structure? Uh, they're, so you saw the picture with the four polymerases, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. There's quite a bit of variation among different virus RDRP because they have different, especially if a, a plus compared to a minus compared to a double-stranded RNA. Uh, I don't think we're going to look at that very much here, but they don't, they don't all look like poliovirus RDRP, although they do have an active site with, you know, the trio of amino acids needed for catalysis. What's the importance of NTP? So NTP, nucleoside triphosphate, those are the precursors of RNA and DNA, the bases from which the long RNA molecules and the long DNA molecules are made. I showed you some in the pictures. And you can, it's consisting of a base attached to a ribose and then three phosphates. That is then incorporated into RNA in this case. Two phosphates are gone. You have one phosphate left. Is RNA polymerase action happening in water or inside the membrane? Well, it's in the cytosol on the surface or inside membrane vesicles, depending on the virus. You'll see ex various examples of that. For poliovirus, it's on the surface of the me of the vesicle. So it's in an aqueous environment. But we, we think it's on the surface of a vesicle to concentrate the components so they don't have to just diffuse around the cytoplasm and bump into each other. Our base is transported to the active site. 
uh, by mechanism uh, other than diffusion. So, uh, you know, everything I've told you so far is that things don't happen by diffusion. But these are small molecules, and we don't know of any carriers so far that would bring them around. So I think that uh, their concentrations are simply high. But that could be wrong. It's a good question. Synthesizing a long protein and chopping it up. Is this unusual in biology in general? It is very common in viruses. Less so, but not unheard of in cells. So what was the purpose of cleavage of VPG? I'm not sure what step you mean. PG is part of the long polyprotein, right? It has to be released by cleavage. I haven't even said this, but it is removed when the RNA is translated later, but we haven't talked about that. Must have been a nice puzzle to figure this all out. Yes, and that's exactly what it is. It's a puzzle, and many groups worked on it, a lot of different papers, and that goes for a lot of the stories I tell you. It is a puzzle that takes time to work out. And then you can be useful therapeutically. And so knowing this, we can make inhibitors of RNA synthesis. How are these uh, molecular mechanisms figured out? So in vitro assays, biochemical assays, where you add components and look at the reactions and see what you need and so forth, three-dimensional structures as well, so a combination. And then introducing changes in the genome and trying to get infectious virus to confirm what you think is going on. Where does the VPG come from, from the binding of that cisRNA element? So actually, the, the VPG is produced from a polyprotein precursor. And, and so, in fact, if, if you look at one of those slides, VPG is present on a precursor, and it can be cleaved off. Maybe it's not in one of those slides, but that's the idea. It's in a precursor, and it's cleaved off. How can we identify the cleavage sites in a polyprotein? So there are two ways. You could get the purified proteins and sequence them and see what the N and C termini are, and then you know from knowing the polyprotein sequence where they've been cleaved. Uh, or you can make changes in the genome. You could mutate the genome and Say, okay, when I change this amino acid, it's no longer cleaved, so that must be part of the active site. So, in fact, you would do both together. Okay, let me stop there, and let's go to uh, the quiz. What do we have? Most of you got um, C, circularization of the template for initiation. That is part of the polio reproduction strategy, replication. Production of subgenomic, not for polio, for the flavies, uh, for the alpha viruses it is, as we'll see in a moment. De novo, without primer, no. It, it uses VPG as a primer. Okay, so it's just C. That is, that is important. So the other ty types of viruses I want to mention here are the alpha viruses, where they make a subgenomic mRNA. Just to give you a sense of, of the purposes for that. These are called togaviridae because of the way the particle looks. The, the viral genome is mRNA, as it is for poliovirus, but not all of it is translated. These viruses come in by endocytosis. Eventually, the, at low pH, the RNA comes out of the particle into the cytosol. It's engaged by ribosomes. But not all of the RNA is translated. Only the left-hand portion, which encodes the polymerase, and then the polymerase establishes replication centers on vesicles. And then from the minus strands, a subgenomic RNA is made that gives rise to the structural proteins uh, to make new virus particles. Well, the, the assembly here, I am skimming over because we have an entire session on assembly. And here's the, how it works. We have the genome RNA, which is capped, polyadenylated. This gets in the cytoplasm. It is translated to form 
the RNA polymerase and other proteins needed for RNA synthesis. This is translated as a polyprotein, which is processed by a uh, protease, which is encoded right in this polyprotein. But translation stops about right there. There's a stop codon in the RNA. And the rest of the genome encodes the structural proteins. The way to access that, you have to first make a negative strand, shown here in olive green. That's the polymerase that copies the plus, makes a minus. It then makes an mRNA starting at that stop codon. So that's their subgenomic mRNA, which is then translated to form the structural proteins. Now you may say, what is the purpose of this? And as I said, it's not clear. I mean, it, one, one effect is to make polymerase first because you really do need that to get uh, the RNAs replicated. Uh, and you don't need the structural proteins right away, so perhaps it's a way of delaying it. But naysayers would say in Picornas and Flavi viruses, they're all made at the same time, and that works. And you'd be right. So I don't have a good answer for this. It may be that in its niche, it's just quite success successful. Now, I usually don't talk about coronaviruses uh, in this lecture because they don't illustrate any principle beyond what we've already learned. But of course, it's important to do that now. So let's take a look at coronavirus uh, RNA synthesis. Uh, coronaviruses, they bind to receptors, they're internalized. The RNA is in the cytosol. Actually, the RNA can come out from within a vesicle or f at the surface, depending on the cell. But let's start with the RNA in the cytoplasm. It's uh, a long 30,000 base RNA, but not all of it is translated, very much like the alpha viruses. Only about a half of the genome is translated to form uh, precursors of the RNA polymerase. And yes, that's a polyprotein. 1A and 1AB are polyproteins that are processed by a viral protease embedded in it. The proteins that are produced induce the synthesis of membrane vesicles, and on those occurs RNA synthesis. Both genome replication, where we go through a minus strand intermediate, so you copy the genome, to form a minus strand, and then it's copied again to form a plus strand. And those will eventually be put into new virus particles in a process we'll talk about later. But you also need to access the right-hand side of the genome, and that is done by making subgenomic mRNAs, very similar to what we saw for the Toga viruses. Uh, and these subgenomic mRNAs encode uh, many proteins, including the structural proteins. So here on the right is a map of those subgenomic mRNAs. So the genome of this of coronaviruses is shown here in, in uh, the left part of B, the 30,000 base genome. And remember, when that gets into cells, only 1A and 1B are translated. There's a stop codon after those. So to access all the other viral proteins, including spike and M and N, the virus produces subgenomic mRNAs, and there are quite a few of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And each is longer than the next one. So, and, and in each one, only the very first open reading frame is translated. So open reading frames, which are parts of the mRNA that code for protein, those are shown as uh, brown boxes or tan boxes here. So here on this first mRNA, only the 2A protein is made. From the next one, only the HE, only the spike from the next one, not the others. Ribosomes can't make uh, more than one. These all have their own uh, initiating uh, methionine, so they, they cannot be accessed. And all the way down to the last mRNA, which encodes only N protein. And so... In infected cells, you have a series of subgenomic mRNAs. And again, you could ask, what's the function of that? Uh, why don't you just make a long polyprotein? And I, we don't have an answer. It just works. Now, the way this these subgenomic RNAs are made is fascinating. This is unique, and really just for this reason, it should be part. And, and in fact, this is part of uh, previous lectures. We always talk about this process. So here we have a 
coronavirus uh, genome. So uh, let us say this is the plus strand on top. And the polymerase is going to bind to the 3' prime end and start to synthesize a negative strand. And you know, if we were if we were making new copies of the genome, it would copy the whole thing as a negative strand and then make a plus strand. But for mRNAs, it does something different. Uh, the polymerase, which is shown as this gray oval there, starts at the 3' prime end, and then when it reaches these these cyan uh, regions, these are signals. The polymerase skips over most of the sequence and goes all the way up to another cyan sequence, way at the five prime end of the genome. All right, so it, and it it skips at different TRSs, and that's how it makes the different subgenomic mRNAs. And so here in this case, uh, it has skipped all the way to the five prime end, and so the result is. And then it stops. Then it, the result is a subgenomic mRNA. And depending on which TRS it skips from to the very fry prime end, it will encode a different protein. You end up with a negative strand copy of the subgenomic mRNA, which is then copied again to make the plus mRNAs. And all these mRNAs have a common TRS at the five prime end because that's where the polymerase skipped. So this is remarkable. The polymerase doesn't simply start and stop to make the mRNAs. And for why this is so, or what's the function of this is unknown, but it rather skips. Instead of st starting and stopping, it skips all the way to the five prime end. So here's the five prime end uh, of the uh, RNA genome, which we folded back. You know, here it is normally at the five prime end. We folded it back to, sh to illustrate this process. And that's your mRNA. It's one mRNA. So uh, this is how mRNAs are made. And it's very important to understand. This mechanism allows for high rates of recombination because when this polymerase skips to the 5' prime end, it could be a different RNA. So the polymerase is really good at skipping, but it doesn't have to be the same RNA. So if a cell is infected with two coronaviruses, you can get a recombinant. And that's why coronaviruses have such high recombination frequency. SARS-CoV-2 is a recombinant of many, of multiple different uh, SARS-CoV-2-like viruses from bats. Let's go to minus strand RNA viruses. We're going to talk about two kinds. We're going to talk about vi minus viruses where the genome is one minus RNA. And that's vesicular stomatitis virus. So the genome is actually in the middle here, this olive-colored RNA. And that genome has to be replicated, and you have to make mRNAs from it. Remember, the genome is not mRNA, so you have to have two processes. And then we're going to talk about influenza viruses. Same question. You have a minus RNA. You have to make mRNAs and more genomes, except this is a segmented genome. So let's start with VSV. The genome is not mRNA, obviously, because it's minus stranded. It's released into the cytosol after uncoding. It cannot be engaged by ribosomes because it's a minus RNA. So it brings in a polymerase, which then synthesizes first a set of subgenomic mRNAs. And those encode the proteins, which can then encode more polymerase to make more mRNAs and eventually to start copying the negative strand genome to make more plus and then more minus RNAs. And so here is a, an illustration of a general concept. When the viral genome is not messenger RNA, there has to be a switch from mRNA to genome synthesis. Because early on you're making mRNAs, you need a lot of protein to get going, but then you have to switch to genome synthesis. So we're gonna look at how that happens. Here's the VSV genome, vesicular stomatitis virus. We've, we've seen these bullet-shaped particles. The genome is a minus RNA. It's quite long, about 12,000 bases, I believe. Uh, and as this enters the cell, it's got a polymerase in the particle, two different proteins here. It makes mRNAs. It makes one, two, three, four, five mRNAs that encode different proteins, including the polymerase, which is this big protein down here. And 
that's the first thing that happens when this RNA gets into the cell. It makes mRNAs. And here's a detailed explanation of that. Here's the minus strand genome. It comes in the cell coated with N protein. It's a nucleocapsid. The polymerase in the particle recognizes the 3 prime N and begins to synthesize mRNAs. And those mRNAs are shown here, and they're encoding uh, each an individual protein. The, L, the lmRNA encodes the polymerase. It's quite large. At some point, we need to make more genomes, right? We can't just keep making mRNAs because you could never build a virus from just mRNAs. They're, they're too short. So at some point, we have to go into replication mode. We go from mRNA synthesis to replication mode. We're making complete plus strands. And then from those, we make minus strands. And what's the switch? The switch is the end protein. Early in infection, there's, not, there's no end protein except what's coding the minus strand genome. But as you make mRNAs and you begin to translate them, you make more and more of each protein, including N. And at a certain point when N reaches a certain level, it begins to coat that first plus strand that is made, and it causes anti-termination. So each of these mRNAs occurs when the polymerase starts and stops. And another word we use for stopping is termination. Start, stop, start, stop, etc. The end protein causes the polymerase not to stop. We call that anti-termination. So now instead of making individual mRNAs, you make one long RNA. Now that's a plus RNA, so it's not useful except to make a minus, which can then be put into virus particles. So the switch from mRNA synthesis to genome replication is caused by nuclear protein. Here's how the synthesis occurs in some detail. The, this is the genomic RNA. And here's the polymerase at the 3' prime end. It's copying to make that first mRNA. There is a termination signal in the RNA called the intergenic or Ig sequence. That causes the polymerase to stop. But the polymerase doesn't fall off. It starts again. And it makes the next mRNA. And then it stops at the intergenic sequence. And it makes the next one. Start, stop, start, stop. And at each intergenic sequence, here's the actual sequence of that intergenic region, which has a stop sequence. It tells the polymerase to stop. There's also a stretch of U's. And the polymerase encounters it before stopping and starts to make, to copy it over and over. It slips and recopies this U7 sequence. And the result is it makes about 200 A's until it finally stops. There's actually a stem loop in this region that, that the RNA polymerase bumps up against it, but it just keeps copying the U's for a while. And that's how it makes a poly A tail. I think this is fabulous, right, that it makes the polymerase basically stutter. And then you have your first, uh, you have your mRNA with a poly A, and then the polymerase goes, all right, enough of that. Let's go on to the next mRNA. Okay, so that is an overall view of VSV. Switch from genome, from mRNA synthesis, the genome is caused by N, and polyadenylation is by slippage at the intergenic sequence. How about influenza virus? Same problem. The genome is not mRNA. There has to be a switch. So the only difference for flu is that the genome is in pieces, eight pieces as a compared to one, and it's more complicated because the, the the genome is actually reproduced or replicated in the cell nucleus. And so there's a lot of movement of things happening here. But I, I will simplify you for you. There's the genome, the virus particle taken in by endocytosis. The, the genome gets out. Genome then goes through the nuclear pore into the nucleus. And there, it's negative strands, so it's accompanied by an RNA polymerase. It's copied to make mRNAs. The mRNAs go out, they make viral proteins, uh, and uh, eventually the 
virus switches from mRNA to genome synthesis. Now we make genomes in the nucleus. They have to get out and eventually assemble into new virus particles. We'll, we'll talk about many aspects of this later, but I want to focus on the mRNA synthesis part. Here's the genome, eight pieces. There's an mRNA associated with each one, and the mRNA can code for one or, or several proteins. How do we do this? So here's the RNA genome that comes in with the particle. Uh, it is um, olive colored because it's a minus strand. It comes in with a polymerase, and the polymerase starts synthesizing at the three prime end, of course, and it's gonna be making mRNAs, but it needs a primer. It's a primer dependent enzyme. And the primer is a piece of RNA it takes from host cell mRNAs. In the nucleus, it cleaves a piece of each mRNA with a cap at about 12 or 13 bases and uses that as a primer to make its mRNA. So here's a viral mRNA at the top, capped. The cap comes from the host cell, poly A at the three prime end. The cap and this 12 or so nucleotides on every flu mRNA comes from the host. If you sequenced flu mRNAs, you'd see the five prime end of every one comes from the host cell because that's where the primer comes from. All right, and those mRNAs are made for each segment of negative strand RNA. Now, of course, they have the virus has to make more genomes, right? So it has to make more minus strands. Now, the catch is these mRNAs fall about 20 bases short of the template. There's a terminator at, at the end here. So each mRNA is not a complete copy of the template. Why that is, you'll see in a moment. It has to do with the topology of the enzyme. So how do you make genomes? Well, yes, at some point, you will make more and more nuclear protein. And when that reaches a certain level, just like for VSV, it will cause the polymerase to go all the way to the five prime end of the template and make a full length plus strand. Then that can be copied again to make more genomes. So in both cases, nuclear protein is the switch for from mRNA to genome synthesis. The cap stealing, it's called cap snatching actually, is important. So let's look at it in some detail. The viral RNA polymerase has an enzyme associated with it called an endonuclease, which can make a cleavage of cellular mRNAs. About Again, about 13 bases in. Here's the cap structure up here, and then you have 13 bases. And then it uses the polymerase will use this as a primer. You can see a couple of bases here uh, are, are can hybridize with the, the end of the minus strand RNA. The polymerase will then use that as a primer to elongate and make a messenger RNA. And the, the extent of homology is very low. In this case, it's a, a single um, GU pair. And then the next base added is complementary to this C. But these nevertheless are the primers for mRNA synthesis. Now, the reason this is important is because the enzyme that does this, the viral enzyme, is actually the target of a relatively new antiviral that we'll talk about later. Here's the structure of the influenza virus uh, polymerase. It's made up of three different proteins. They're colored uh, differently here. And at the bottom is a schematic of, of them. So we have uh, PB1, uh, PB2, and PA. And so PA is... is uh, shown as two ovals, and PB2 has multiple ovals here because they're different domains. Uh, PB1 uh, is the part of the enzyme that actually polymerizes the genome. Uh, PB2 is, recognizes the cap on the primer, and PA is actually the endonuclease that cleaves host cell mRNAs to make the primers. And so what happens is we start... Here at the top, we have our genome RNA that has to be made into an mRNA. It's a negative strand. Here's the, this polymerase as synthesized is inactive. It will first bind a capped cellular mRNA in the cap binding part of PB2. So that's shown here. The genome, the minus strand genome, will also bind 
the polymerase. And in fact, the five prime end of that genome will bind a site on the, on the active part or the catalytic part of the enzyme shown there in red. The, uh, if, this were a, if this were a viral RNA, I'm sorry, if, if this were um, an incorrect RNA that were somehow binding to the, to the enzyme, the enzyme would never become activated. But when this is an influenza viral RNA, it has a specific sequence also at the three prime end, which will bind to another site on the enzyme. So now the, the viral RNA is bound to two sites on the enzyme. That activates the endonuclease, which cleaves the cellular mRNA, which has been held in there. And then the polymerase can utilize that fragment as a primer. So all of this happens on the same enzyme, the cleaving of the mRNA and then the priming uh, on the vRNA. And so the key here, the other key is that this template is locked onto the enzyme at both ends. That has important implications, as you will see here. So now the, the enzyme has started to polymerize. It's added a cap, and it's copied quite a bit of the three prime end of the viral RNA. So there's, and what we think is happening is that the template is pulled through the active site. The enzyme isn't moving along the template as we typically think for most enzymatic uh, nucleic acid reactions. The template, this minus strain, is being pulled through the active site, and then it's, it's polymerizing an, an mRNA. Remember, the cap comes from the host cell, right? So what's going to happen here? At some point, you're going to reach the end, right? But the five prime end of the RNA is still attached to the enzyme. It doesn't come loose. And so that's why the enzyme cannot copy the entire vRNA, the minus RNA, because it's stuck. It so happens that where it's stuck, there's a stretch of U. And what do you think happens? Yeah, polymerase stutters and makes a poly A tail, sort of like the VSV example, although this is a different mechanism because here now the the template, the minus strand template is immobilized. The enzyme can't pull it through anymore. And so that's why you are short of the end of the RNA and you can make a poly A tail. So at some point you have to overcome this. You have to overcome the, this termination. And that's done with the nucleoprotein. Apparently that allows copying uh, of the entire genome. So let's go to another quiz here. I think this is our last one for today. How are influenza and VSV RNA synthesis similar? The switch from mRNA to genome is controlled by an RNA binding protein. Polydenylation occurs at a short stretch of U. Viral mRNAs are shorter than minus genome RNA or all of the above. And while you are contemplating that, let's go back to the questions here. Oh, there are a lot since last time. There we go. Finally found. <laughs> so VPG is a protein primer. Yes, VPG with two U's added to it. Exactly. Is the membrane of the vesicle the same as the membrane of the cell? Yes. It is derived from the host cell and has very similar composition. Yep. Do any virus genomes contain non-coding sequence? Absolutely. Um, it's usually not junk. It's usually got some function.
Do we know if SARS-CoV-2 synthesis occurs in double membrane vesicles? Yeah, yes, we do. On the surface of the double membrane vesicles. And you want to know, could we inhibit that as a strategy? So you couldn't inhibit the lipid synthesis because those that's done by cellular enzymes that are needed for the cell. And so your drug would get into uninfected cells and would have toxicity. But you could inhibit the polymerase, which is the basis for uh, many antivirals and, and molnupiravir, which looks like it's going to be approved soon, or at least given EUA. Yes, do we detect these subgenomic RNAs in PCR? Yes, 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 and that's why a PCR positive doesn't mean you have infectious virus because there's a ton of mRNAs that are picked up by the PCR. Of course, depending on where the primer is, if it's a spike primer, you're going to pick up spike mRNAs as well as genome. And so you have no idea how much mRNA versus virus there is. So, uh huh. So does this S subgenomic mRNA for ORF one AB possess the whole genome? No, no. It's just the left hand, roughly, of the genome. It's the mostly the uh, proteins involved in. RNA reproduction. This slippage seems like splicing without the splicing. Yeah, it, it is. It's a way of, well, it's non-templated synthesis, right? Is this correct? Recombination is exchange of any part of the genome and reassortment between segments. That's correct. So reassortment is mixing of whole segments between viruses. In recombination, you can copy part of one RNA and part of another, skipping from one template to another. Can I explain exactly why 200? Well, it's an average. 200 is an average, okay? So it can be less or it can be more. If you, an average of 200 days. What does slippage mean? Uh, is it expected to happen? Well, slippage means the polymerase reaches a bunch of U's and sits there but keeps copying them and making a product without moving. Maybe slippage is not the right word, but that's what we call it. Uh, maybe because it moves one and slips back and moves one. But can we? So probably it's dependent on sequence in that area. The sequence, maybe a stem loop, is causing the enzyme to stop. It makes most sense to me and you to be a plus RNA come in and immediately make proteins. Yeah, I, I agree. As I said before, if I were designing a virus from scratch billions of years ago, I'd make them all plus RNA. But there are obviously niches in which other configurations work and are competitive. So that's why we have all the seven Baltimore classes. How much time is mRNA tra translated? Well, mRNAs can last anywhere from seconds to minutes to hours to days. So they have different half-lives, as we say, depending on sequences in the RNA that control that, and their cellular enzymes that chop them up. How long does it take to translate? Can be quick, can take many hours. Depends on the mRNA. I think this lecture was harder than the one last week. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're diving a little deeper. And the next few, I think the first half of this course is, is hard, but then the second half is less hard because it's more descriptive. But stay with us. It's okay. You're getting something out of it, please. Oh, you can always listen again, right? All right, finally, is the, two more. Is the process of copying from the template destructive. No, it is not destructive. The template can be copied many times. 
What's the function of the polyate tail? It is important for translation. Without a polyate tail, messages don't translate as well. Yeah, and this was the same question. Does the length matter? Yeah, if the polyate tail is too short, translation doesn't work as well. Okay. We'll come back to questions at the end, but let's see what we have here. Uh, the, res the answer is all of the above. Everything uh, is, is, is a reason for them being similar. The switch is controlled by an RNA binding protein, N or NP. Polydenylation is at a stretch of U, right, in both VSV and flu. The R mRNAs are shorter than the genome. So all of the above are correct. Last set of viruses we're going to talk about, double-stranded RNA viruses, real viruses. Remember, there's a plus strand in there and a minus strand, but it can't be translated if this RNA got into the cell because the minus strand is blocking the ribosomes from getting at the plus strand. And so this vi these viruses have to carry an RNA polymerase in the particle because when the RNA is in the cell, that polymerase will make messages for translation and also uh, plus strand messages for making new genomes. So this is the configuration of these genomes. They're double-stranded RNAs. They can be in various numbers of segments. Uh, and again, the plus strand is not accessible by ribosomes. These, remember, these viruses are unusual double-shelled capsids. They're taken in by endocytosis. The particle remains in the endosome even after lysosomes fuse. And the lysosomes remove the outer shell and the core particle is hydrophobic, can penetrate out of the lysosome into the cytoplasm. So now we have a core with the different RNA segments. And the RNAs do not leave the core. mRNA synthesis occurs within the core. There's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the core, and that polymerase makes mRNAs, which then come out of these turrets, which are openings at the five-fold axis. In the particle, in the native particle, the outer shell blocks the opening through the turret. But when the outer shell is removed, there's now a passageway. The mRNAs, which are these little squiggly guys, they're capped. They come out into the cytoplasm where they can then be translated to make proteins. And those proteins can go to assemble and form new virus particles. And those particles will have 10 or 12 mRNAs in them. They're single-stranded mRNAs. So here's some of these mRNAs floating around in the cytoplasm. And those particles have polymerase in them as well. So the polymerase can make the plus strand double-stranded. And those can then go on and assemble into new virus particles. Or they could go on and make more mRNAs, depending on where you are in the infected cell. So this is very unusual in that the genome doesn't leave the particle, right? It, there's no uncoding. The mRNA remains, while well, the double-stranded genome remains in the particle, uh, and uh, mRNAs are made. They come out. They're captured into new particles. Uh, and so this is an unusual situation. Here's the virus, uh, complete virion, and then progressively taking off the uh, outer shell until you get the core that can penetrate through into the cytoplasm. And you can see in the earlier, the two earlier stages, there's a plug in that turret. That's at the five-fold axis, at each five-fold axis. Then the, the plug is gone, and the double-stranded RNA, the mRNAs made, can go out uh, through the turret. And again, each double-stranded RNA uh, it can be copied to form an mRNA that encodes one or more proteins. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, the cryo-EM of an actively transcribing rotavirus core was, was solved. So what they did was they took cores with double-stranded RNA and they incubated them, incubated them in a condition that would allow RNA synthesis. And this is what they saw. These are the RNAs coming out of each turret. Each of these is the five-fold axis, one, two, three, four, five, and the, the hole would be there. And these are each mRNAs coming out, and they're capped. The red dot is a cap. 
Um, and in fact, each double-strand RNA segment inside this core is attached to a molecule of polymerase at each five-fold axis. So there seems to be a molecule of polymerase at each five-fold axis of symmetry. The double-stranded RNA is attached to it to the cap, and it just cranks out mRNAs that pass through uh, the opening. So think about it. Here's a question for you. How many five-fold axes of symmetry are there? And does that predict the maximum number of double-stranded RNA segments that we see in any real virus. And the, yes, we have no real virus with more than 12 segments. We have 12, we have 10, we have less, but none with more than 12 because yeah, each is attached to a 12, five-fold axis of symmetry and there are only 12 in the particle. All right, the last topic for today is origins of diversity. And this is related to the processes we've talked about. There's some new twists. What do I mean? Everything has to mutate in order to evolve. And viruses are no exception. And among RNA viruses, there are two sources of diversity. First is misincorporation of nucleotides. Polymerases all make mistakes, but most RNA polymerases don't have proofreading. They don't have erasers. So... Many polymerases have high error frequencies, the RNA polymerases, uh, and they can't correct the errors. Typically, one mistake in 1,000 to 10,000 bases polymerized. That's a lot. And, and the average error frequency among RNA polymerases is one in 10,000 or 100,000. So if you have a, a mistake, if you make a mistake every 10,000 bases in a 10,000 base RNA genome, you get one mutation every time the genome is copied. And there are way more than 10,000 new viruses made in an infected cell. So you can potentially, in one infected cell, make changes at every position in that genome. Think about that. That's why these are masters of the universe, <laughs> at least masters of the earth, these RNA viruses. Now, the exception, of course, are the nidovirales, the order under which the coronavirus family fits. By the way, nido is Latin for nest because of the nested mRNAs that we talked about today. The uh, coronavirus genome encodes a protein called XON, which is an exonuclease that corrects errors. So it's a three to five prime exonuclease. It chews RNA from the three to a five prime direction and it moves along with the polymerase. So here is the uh, RNA polymerase complex made of a lot of different proteins. The, the uh, enzyme is in red. Here's XON, NSP14. And if the polymerase makes a mistake, XON can cut it out. And so um, it, it helps bring down the error rate compared to other viruses. And that's why we think that these nidovirales can have very, very big genome sizes. If you take the gene for XON out of a coronavirus, you have a 15 to 20 fold increased mutation rate and these viruses are quite sick and some people have explored using those uh, as vaccines because they're not pathogenic. What determines the error rate? Well, there are actually, there's actually some information about it. They, remember that the way the enzymes work is that bases go in and out of the channel very quickly. And so the, the, um, the, way, the, the frequency of making errors depends on the, the active site, how the template and the primer and the NTP shown here in purple interact at the active site. So what happens is, remember, all the four NTPs go in and out of the channel really quickly. And if it's the wrong NTP, um, it's not going to lead to polymerization because what happens is when, the, when an NTP first comes in, it binds to the active site in a way that doesn't allow the ribose to interact uh, with these uh, conserved bases. But if the NTP is correctly paired with the template, then a conformational change in the enzyme occurs, the, re, the triphosphate is reoriented, and then you will have catalysis. And so the wrong base comes in, 
it usually doesn't go out, but sometimes the polymerase makes a mistake and does incorporate the wrong base at a frequency of 1 in 10,000, 1 in 100,000 times. There have been more faithful polymerases made And here's an example of poliovirus RDRP. A single amino acid change here on the back of the enzyme. It's G64S, glycine at number 64 amino acid to serine. This polymerase makes fewer errors than the wild-type polymerase does. Remember, again, here's the active site. Here is this, this amino acid change that makes a more faithful polymerase. And the way this works is that this change appears to slow that conformational change in the enzyme that I've told you about uh, that happens on base pairing. It, it slows down the elongation, the addition of bases. And what we think happens is when a wrong base gets in, it is kicked out more frequently than in the wild-type enzyme because it slows everything down. And, and you may think, well, this is remote from the active site. Uh, how, how does that work? It probably affects the overall change of the enzyme when the wrong base is getting in. Uh, and this is probably something conserved among different uh, RNA polymerases. But this, this change is never seen in nature. Why? It's very, very unfit. It cannot compete A virus with G64S cannot compete with wild-type virus in cell culture experiments. It doesn't cause disease in animals. So this is an experimentally induced change, but doesn't exist in nature. Why? Because mutation is good for viruses, as we'll see later. Recombination is the the other process that leads to diversity, Um, and we have talked about this, exchange of of sequences among different genomic molecules is distinct from reassortment. So a polymerase is copying a one one RNA shown here as the donor. It switches to another, and now you have uh, an RNA which has sequences from both viruses. So acceptor and donor are RNAs from two different viruses. Obviously, they have to be distinct in sequence for you to detect it as as a recombinant. And this can be high frequency. In poliovirus infections, you can get up to 10 to 20 percent uh, recombination. This can also be controlled by amino acids in the polymerase. And in fact, a single amino acid change here in the uh, in the uh, enzyme in in uh, the fingers domain, uh, leucine at 420 to alanine, this will reduce recombination frequency. And this is located uh, in the RNA exit channel. We think it works by reducing the speed of the enzyme, reducing the initiation rate, uh, reducing the stability of the elongation complexes. So it's less likely that the enzyme is going to move to another template. So recombination is decreased. And these two properties of fidelity and recombination are going to come back when we talk about uh, evolution. I'm sorry if that was hard, but uh, go back and listen again um, and uh, think about it. I think a lot of the concepts that we're talking about today are really important. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about transcription, which is the synthesis of mRNA from DNA templates and RNA processing, which includes splicing. All right, let's do a a few more questions. questions here. Let me find, okay. Oh, that's not the right star. I'm now putting a star on the comments as a way for me to find, there we go, there's the last one. (laughs) The amount of information is staggering. Sorry. Listen to it again. Don't feel stupid. It's fine. It's tough stuff. And and thank you, Marge716, for your contribution. (laughs) I really appreciate it. This is where a glossary would be helpful. I'll work on it. I have a a few irons in the fire. To understand this structural language, 
I don't know if you need basic organic hem. A glossary might be enough. So let me put a glossary up, and you can um, try that. And, you know, the more we talk, the more you're going to understand. So with virus, you'd expect some sort of active transport into the core. Well, I, I'm not aware of any active transport that has been uh, discovered. So maybe in this case, diffusion is, is what we're left with for now. Yeah. Yeah, the next few lectures when we talk about nucleic acids uh, are, the, are the hardest parts. Yes. But the more you listen, the more um, more familiar you get. Thank you so much. I wish I'd found you when doing uni. Yeah, a lot of people say that. How does XON determine there's a mistake? Nobody knows. That's a good question. Because it's obviously got an active site, which can somehow detect the not quite right base pairing. But... And that's something people would like to know very much, but there's no answer, yeah. Good question. How many uh, base pairs can XON cut out? So it, it will cut out a few. It will you know, detect a mismatch, and then it may be down. the polymerase may already be downstream a bit, so then it has to go back up a few bases to cut out, yeah. All we need to do is figure out how to plug the NTP portal on the polymerase. That's plugging things physically is hard. Catalysis, inhibiting catalysis is easier, an enzymatic reaction. But yeah, that could be a good uh, that could be a good target. As we'll see later with RT, there are drugs that bind away from the active site. Not everything has to go in the active site. So this would be another idea like that. Yeah. Enzymes are the best. They are the best, and they're great to inhibit because you don't need a lot of them. So the lo the quantities are lower and more amenable to uh, inhibition by small molecules. Does fidelity and recombination go together? Well, the two chain, the two mutants that I talked about, they're independently controlled. So the recombination defective polymerase has normal fidelity. So they're, I think they're separate regulated events. In oral polio vaccine, do they modify the polymerase to make it less likely to revert? So yes, in fact, they do. They put in those two changes to reduce, uh, to increase, uh, to, to reduce error rate and reduce recombination. To prevent reversion, yes. And in fact, when we there's a new OPV2, new oral polio vaccine number serotype 2, which is going to be used soon. And we talked about that one on TWIV, and that's those are the two changes they stuck in the polymerase. Yes, the lower reversion and lower recombination. Yeah, good. Good catch. Thanks, James, for your contribution. Appreciate it. I love your textbook, but it makes for slow reading. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's hard. But it's there. Did I get that right? Did someone come up with the fidelity changes to the amino acid? Well, we're going to talk about that in uh, evolution lecture, how we got that poliopolymerase that is um, um, more, more faithful. And that's a really cool story on its own. Thank you, Barb Mack, for your contribution. My brain is fried, but it's okay. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on a glossary. Yeah, so if you have the textbook, there is a glossary, but not everyone has it, so we'll try to put something online. Does COVID-19 virus have error correction? Yes, yes. It's a coronavirus. All the coronas have the error correction. Let this be a lesson for all the experts. Virology is humbling, easy to confuse. See, the problem is that most people don't know the a fraction of what I've told you. 
and they come in and they're not virologists, so they get it wrong. So I'm not boasting. I've just done it for 40 years. So take advantage of me while I'm still here. I'm putting myself at your disposal. But, you know, the, the news network's not interested. I was on CNN once last February, and that was the end. <laughs> so that's why I'm here teaching you guys. It's good. All, all 180 of you. That's a good comment, Ronnie D. 1970. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Elka, for your contribution. Wow. A person who has watched multiple times all your lectures since 2015. This is the best. The, the live stream is cool because you guys can talk to each other, right? I like that a lot. Then you mentioned you discussed the mechanism of some antiviral. Yeah, in the antiviral lecture. It's going to build upon this knowledge that you have today for sure. Where can I find your textbook? Oh, the usual suspects. You could go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any online bookseller. You can even buy a used copy of a older edition or even the new edition. You could find used copies. Yeah. What is the criteria for a virus to have XON? As, so we think that the nidovirales, of which coronavirus are a member, right? We think they have an XON because um, it allows the genome to get that big. With as you, as you increase the genome size, the likelihood that a mutation is going to knock it out becomes greater and greater, right? And so at some point, you need an exonuclease. And the other viruses don't have one because their genome is small and they can survive uh, without it. That's what our thinking is. Thank you, John, for your contribution. <laughs> uh, you, you note prerequisites are two semester of a rigorous uh, biology course. So that, that's for our Columbia students. I to take this course. So it, in, at Columbia, there's some good first-year biology courses. So this way I get sophomores, juniors, and seniors who have taken that. So I think if you go to the Khan Academy, you can find some good introductory biology courses there. Maybe some people in the chat can help you with that. <laughs> I was on CNN and that was the end. Uh, it's fine. They've they got other people who are, you know, the usual suspects who have big personalities, big mouths. They're wrong most of the time or a lot of the time. It's fine. I'm not worried. I have my own, um, I have my own platform, and I'm slowly being found. You know, Lex Friedman found me. Jillian Michaels. I've got some irons for some other pods in the fire. So I'm very patient. That's how I've built TWIV. And the problem is, yes, virology is hard. So is immunology. Dr. Facebook's, Dr. Twitter, they think they know it all without taking the course. And I'm telling you, the people who write for the Times and all the mainstream media, you think they've taken my course? No. Why not? I don't have the time. Well, then don't write about viruses. That's the way I look at it. And you know who I'm talking about. Thank you, Susan, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Chocolate helped with this lecture. Very good. Is it possible to engineer changes in the polymerase to make the virus more unstable and making more errors so it cannot cause disease? Uh, you don't have to make it more unstable. You can make it less uh, and then you could have a vaccine because, remember, I told you the polyopolymerase, which makes less mistakes, is not pathogenic in mice. So you could make – and, in fact, for the coronas, you could target the XON. If you remove XON, you can still grow the virus, but it doesn't cause disease. So that's a potential uh, vaccine. The problem is 
maybe it would pick up a XON from a different corona in a co-infected animal somewhere and regain it. And so that's a bit of a concern. Is RNA antiparallel in an upward spin? Yeah, it's an it is it double stranded RNA. Yeah, but the, the structure is different from DNA. It doesn't have that major and minor groove, I believe. Someone else is um, probably much better than that. Then you need South Asian version printing. Uh, ASM Press, they're the publishers. Talk to them because actually it's being published by Wiley and Sons now, so they have a big reach. They could do that. Mutations that change antigenic sites can be helpful to evade the immune, but it will not affect the virus's ability to infect the host. Well, that would be the balance, right? Because if it change an antigenic change impacted infection, then it wouldn't survive. So yeah, the antigenic variants that we see are still fit, but they can evade antibodies. We're going to talk about that more later on, yeah. Is that not a why? I, I make the why mistake all the time. I just try not to, but it's hard, I know. And me making a mistake and you picking it up, what better teaching way is there than that? Thank you, Lucic104, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. We listen too much to personalities than experts. Yes. Absolutely. I agree. How did I achieve today's luminous background? You like it? It's There's just the light here. Uh, it's, it's the blue light that I had in my office at Columbia that used to kind of put a wash over the, the back wall. And I brought it here because, you know, I wanted to play with the with the white. I'm I'm even playing with different things. I actually today I brought in I commissioned a very big watercolor from Michelle Banks, Artologica, who does a lot of virus art. And uh, I need to get it framed. I'm going to put it behind me and experiment with that as well. Someone on the Twiv, I did I do everything here now, right? And someone Friday's Twiv, "Oh, your background is boring. You need something else." Ay ay ay. Um, let's see. I'm playing with my look here. It'll change and, um, it's okay. Let's see if we either have, try a lavender shirt. I have lavender shirts. If you've listened, if you've watched Twiv, you know that. I have different colors. Today is a gray shirt. It's Monday is a gray day. <laughs> I have to wear the gray shirt from time to time. Yes, MIT Open Courseware has great biology courses. Thanks for that, D.L. Sandero. Yes, that's a great idea. Great idea. Can a coronavirus mutate to the level render it non-pathogenic? I think so. The common cold coronaviruses are pretty non-pathogenic, and they've been in humans for hundreds of years. I think that's what's happened to them. Yeah. What does the size of the genome of a virus indicate? The evolutionary process that has led to it. In other words, viruses with small genomes have a niche where they have been able to reproduce and transmit among hosts effectively with just one gene. Bigger genomes, they found a niche as well. It just works, as I like to say. All right, folks. Uh, was Dixon upset? No, not at all. Dixon appreciates that I help other artists. I think Michelle Banks is great. I have her watercolor at home. If, you, if you've if you looked at the live streams on Wednesday night, in the background I have one of her watercolors. Um, and I'm getting Dixon's watercolors for here. He said I could go to his house and pick a bunch. I want to put them all throughout the studio. So... Yeah, but oh, one more thing I wanted to show you before we go. I brought in my herpes virus keychains. I actually have several, as I told you. Here they go. I should probably use them, right? <laughs> uh, but you can see, and it may be hard to see here, um, it opens up. 
and um, there's the, uh, I don't have an autofocus, but th there's the capsid opening up and inside the nuclear capsid opening up as well. It's cool. Next time I'll tell you what company you can get these at. Thank you, Ronnie, for your... Um... <laughs> so when I was on CNN, we were waiting behind the stage to go on, and Sanjay Gupta was next to me. We were chatting, and he's... And I remember, this was early in the pandemic, and they were debating whether to test Trump or something. I don't remember what the situation was. And he said, do you think they should test him? I said, of course, he's the president of the U.S. He should be tested. Contact so many people. And he disagreed with me. And then we had to go on. We didn't have a chance to talk about it. Um, human cells present partial proteins on sugars on their surface. What viruses bring their own polymerase. Do they have mechanisms to prevent this? Do, I, I don't understand. Do what have... Yes, there are certainly immune antagonists of all sorts uh, in the genome. Yes, that's the key chain you never lose because it's for life. Maybe I should put my uh, keys on it for the incubator because I'm afraid of losing them. Thank you, Ronnie, for your contributions. <laughs> all right, folks. I think that's it for today. I'll let you all go. I want you to be safe. Come back Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.